Hello, Tim. Hey, Dan. Welcome to the Framework in Focus, a video cast series where we provide insight into our ebook titled Musculoskeletal Clinical Translation Framework from Knowing to Doing. It's a mouthful, Dan. It is, so we shall hereunto refer to it as the framework. We hope this series will complement the ebook and provide additional insight into the whys, whens, wheres, and hows of the framework. And Tim, what is this goal aligned to? Just our ongoing efforts to facilitate this knowledge translation into the management of musculoskeletal pain, Darren. Good, good. I'm also known as Beals. I'm Mitchell. And um, O'Sullivan and Slater aren't here yet. But we'll catch up with them a little bit later on. We will. And uh, this is the second um, uh, recording we've done this morning and, and now we're going to talk about the utility and application of the framework. Yeah. So we have a quote from the English poet David White, stop trying to challenge reality by attempting to eliminate complexity. Just give them a moment to ponder that. Yeah, that's I'm a, pondering it myself. It's a good quote. Yeah, and, and certainly complexity is something we see a lot and speak about a lot in terms of the patients we, we see. Um, and and it, it's easy to ignore complexity sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, it makes it simpler, Yes, <laughs> but as the quote says, that's not necessarily the reality, so yeah, very good to keep in mind. Thanks David White for that one. Okay, so first this is a, a picture from the, uh, directly out of the, the book, and uh, we'll use a few of these kind of pictures throughout the, the different talks we're going to do. Um, this one's around framework application, so probably we can just go through this point by point. So the first um, point in terms of application or um, is around understanding the basic science of the elements within the framework. Um, I do remember in an early version we, we went into those elements in great detail around the evidence of them, but we, we morphed away from that and to the point where we're just like, yeah, we just need to accept that pain is multifactorial and there's biopsychosocial elements to it. Yeah, but it's also around acknowledging this framework is helpful to guide the process, but there's a whole heap of learning and, and background training that can be gained from different health professional qualifications that, you know, give you that understanding of, you know, the basic science behind, you know, not only just pain, but, you know, psychosocial factors and, mm. you know, other interaction around general health and how that impacts on pain, for example. So mm. there's a large degree of assumed knowledge or levels of knowledge that are very important in applying aspects of the framework effectively. Mm. Yeah. And maybe science around communication and learning and different things like that as well. Yeah, for sure. Motivation. Yeah. Um, okay. Good. Uh, the next point, um, or the next box in that figure, is understanding connectedness of the elements. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned this in the, the uh, first little video that we did, that they're definitely not in isolation and that relationship or connectedness can be bi-directional. A classic one might be that when you're in lots of pain that can impact your mood, but we also know the other way around that mood factors can have a direct impact on pain experience as well mm. um, and there's many other examples around that but it's it's really important to be clear mm. that they're not in isolation and as we said it's not a, a linear step-by-step -step process where you you treat this part and then you treat that part yeah things are going to shift and the weighting of what's happening for that person if their dominant issue is pathology initially maybe there's some management on that and healing occurs and then a bit later on, pathology is not the dominant issue, although it might have been at the start, and the interplay of other factors may then mm. be more important to be considering in your management. Mm. I, used to, I used to have a slide, and um, I've, I've just recalled it, and um, it was this study where they look at EMG output of the muscles lifting a box, yeah. <laughs> and so they get the EMG profile of that, and then they get them to lift the box again, but they put them under pressure by come on they go you know they go come on you weak idiot and they're, yeah. they're kind of abusing them so that's a different context to lifting the box and it changes the muscle activation so that kind of thing is really uh, a simple but nice illustration of how there's connectedness between well a psychosocial issue and and lifting <laughs> yeah and for me that's what makes this interesting because you're not doing the same thing each time with every person it is understanding their story and trying to work out with them 
because you can't do it by yourself. You no. can't sit here and, and judge it all by yourself. Yeah. How you work out with them the factors that might be driving their presentation. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and as a clinician, that's, that's a real evolution almost in thinking of like, how do you work out the interrelatedness of these elements? Yeah. Uh, next one, Tim, is um, identifying elements within individual presentations. So yes, the framework certainly built around that. <laughs> yeah, that's fairly self-explanatory, but all those factors or elements won't be strongly relevant for every person. There might be minimal of that. I mean, you take a simple ankle sprain and it might be simple for one person, but it may be way more involved or different factors relevant to that in another person with a simple ankle sprain. Mm. Um, all right, that's good. And then um, the next kind of application is around prioritising contributing factors, so I guess in, in the, as part of the diagnosis, but then certainly into management. Yeah, and that's the key. These things are relevant, but the priority directs your management because the big ticket items or the ones that are most important, that should be reflected in your management. So understanding the interplay in between that, but again, working with the patient to judge what are the dominant factors? And I know, um, in my experience in the past, I've made plenty of errors around this where you've worked out different parts of their presentation or factors in that that are relevant, but you've put a big focus on, let's say, posture or muscle flexibility, for example, where that might be a part of it, and you've done a heap of work on that. That's been the focus of your management. Two, four, six weeks later, they're no better. Yeah. So on reflection, that might have been a factor, but not necessarily a big one or the main driver for that person. Mm. Yeah. And um, every patient with chronic pain has a psychological disorder, don't they, Tim? Well, some would suggest, but <laughs> I wouldn't think that's the case, no, Aaron. No, but it is a, so it is a good example where there might be factors in, in play, but uh, prioritising those and yeah. understanding it is important. Yeah. And just one more thing on that, you might not need to address all of those. Yeah. <laughs> For some of those to then become not so relevant yeah so the classic is you listen to a person and you might be the first person they've come across that's taken the time to listen and understand their perspective and that may go a, a long way to being helpful for for some people yeah good yeah. good um, the next application is a little favorite of mine around matching management to the contributing factors and in the training of specialist physiotherapists in australia um, early on that's a good one to um, pick them up on um, providing management that doesn't match to what they found in their assessment uh, is, is common yeah. um, and we talk about that that we should listen to the person's story mm -hmm. and then do some degree of assessment or, or physical examination with that person but the examination should match what we've heard around mm -hmm. their story and what we're trying to work out or better understand of that mm -hmm. and then from there based on that, working out what's wrong and what's driving it, yeah. then the treatment should be logically following on. Yeah. From treatment or management should be logically following on from that. And it is easy to fall into routines. I'm sure I still do that at times. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but um, yeah, that's not always helpful. Um, the last point we've got here in the application is around the acknowledgement of contextual sensitivity. <laughs> yeah, and that can refer to broader context as in um, culture in terms of if you're living in different parts of the world and the society expectations around that or different cultures of people that come in to see you so the context around pain in different cultures is one example that we might need to be aware of but other um, context around that is also the different systems that you might be working in as well so different healthcare sy systems be that a private health system or a public health system or even a, a workers' compensation system um, where there's some compensable third-party um, involvement in terms of, yeah, another group that we need to be considering when we're putting together the management of a patient. Mm. And, you know, a patient's context is their reality. That's very true. We talk about that all the time, don't mm. we? Yeah, we do. Yeah. And... Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's sometimes you, you do hear patient stories where um, that hasn't that principle hasn't been acknowledged really. <laughs> yeah, and what they're saying may not fit with what we know or logically see. Yeah, but if that's their perspective of what's wrong or what needs to happen, 
that must be considered in in the communication and potentially their management. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Uh, any other points on the application you wanted to make? No, I think they'll come up in the individual elements a bit more as we go. Agreed. So. Um, flipping over to utility now, so first of all utility, you know, we've designed this to be, have broad utility, yeah. um, so number one of course is clinical practice. Yeah, and we've had really great feedback from clinicians saying this has helped clarify their thinking and how they approach managing people with musculoskeletal pain, so that's the obvious one there, that it's helpful for people translating that knowledge into the cold face clinical practice. Yeah. yeah. Um, healthcare practitioner education. And that's where this started. And that was more for us <laughs> <laughs> as educators initially of, so we knew what we were talking about and we were using a consistent language about that. So as not to confuse students basically. Um, but from there that's allowed us to deliver consistent messages and approach things from different perspectives but still have the broad language and um, consistent information there so people can take from that and, and build on that rather than being confused by conflicting information, I think. Yeah. And I think we, I can say we're big proponents that this should um, be given to healthcare provider students day one. Yeah, we've done a little bit of not formal testing but anecdotally around this where it was perhaps considered oh this is too complex for people to take on but we've tried this first lecture and the first semester for students and giving this framework and giving a couple of simple clinical scenarios and those students were really comfortable and did very well of coming up with factors that could be contributing to a, a clinical presentation and we just have to be careful that we don't train people out of thinking you know broadly by delivering the other important components of healthcare education so yeah, yeah early on I think is yeah. a big priority yeah and, and no doubt you can't be an expert in all elements um, after an undergraduate or basic education but knowledge of it's critical yeah <laughs> uh, next we've got um, healthcare practitioner self-development. Yeah, and this has also been interesting where, again, clinicians have, have given that feedback that they've used the e-book and they've really done some things on their own and people with better language skills than us yeah. that don't have English as a, a first language have then used that and then the examples of helping to translate that because they've found utility in it. And then more recently we've developed our app which we'll mention shortly which is for that where you can use that with individual patients to help sort of work on um, some of these the thinking and the components behind this yeah so you, you've rolled on to patient education there and um, yeah so it's clearly a useful tool in terms of um, listening to the patient's story acknowledging all the elements that are relevant to them yeah. um, to give them a broad view yeah, and because the language we've used in, in the framework is consistent across um, not just individual health professions, but broadly across health professions, but also considerate of um, consumers yeah. out there and, and general public as well, the language should be broadly palatable for people. So, um, yeah, it's not difficult in my experience for patients to take on those, those concepts as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. too much jargon in medicine and physiotherapy, the physiotherapist yeah. um, is clearly, you know, a culprit in that regard. Yeah, big time. <laughs> We're good at physio speak, but yes. that's not helpful for anyone. No. Yeah. Okay, good. And um, yeah, another a, a really important thing is engagement of non-medical stakeholders. Um, so we're talking insurance workers, injury management advisors that may not have a full medical background, but are still engaged in the management of pain. Yeah. And family members, I guess. And yeah, <laughs> and either even other health policy makers, for yeah. example. Yeah. But yeah, to use this approach has been, because we've worked on this and you've done some other research in this area, particularly in work-related pain, where translating this information to non-medical stakeholders with different education has been very well received. And then we've seen that being quite effective, haven't we, with dealing with individual injured workers. And then these non-medical stakeholders have been completely aligned with 
a contemporary management of pain because of being able to use this contemporary and consistent language. Yeah, great. Yeah. Great. Good. Any other utility points? No, that's it for me. Thanks, Darren. Brilliant. Uh, so musculoskeletalframework.net is where you can find the framework and other related materials. You mentioned the app a little earlier. Yeah, so that's called MSK Pain. So we've got a little bit better about <laughs> simple words and things that aren't as hard to say. But that's just been released recently and we're doing some feedback testing around that. Um, but if people want to have a look at that and give us other feedback, that would be great. But we think that is a helpful tool for both... Uh, students and clinicians for utilising the framework mm. in practice. And I will mention that um, you know we do charge a, a nominal amount for the ebook and the app. We don't make any money from that at all. It all goes back into um, generation of content. Um, so including the apps being funded by that, the yeah. different translations. We will never make a cent out of this. It's um, it's just there for maintenance purposes. <laughs> yeah, but hopefully. The whole reason we're doing this, it is helpful for people yeah. and um, improves the management of musculoskeletal pain. Yeah, so a small donation in, in um, buying the ebook or the app goes, goes a long way to help. Yeah. Great, so I think we're done for um, number two. So we'll sign off and um, see you in number three. Thanks.